So what I'd like to do is I'm going to read to you the psalm in which we will be studying today as a family, and then I'll dismiss the kids. But hear first the very word of God. Psalm, verse 40. Psalm 40, verse 1. Hear the word. I waited patiently for the Lord. I want, I, as I said last week, we want to enter into this emotional driven, thought provoking psalm of David to the choir master, it says the psalm of David. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the pit of destruction out of the miry bog, and he set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust, who does not turn to the proud, to those who go astray after a lie. You have multiplied, O Lord my God, your wondrous deeds and your thoughts toward me. None can compare with you. I will proclaim and tell of them, yet there are more than can be told. In sacrifice and offerings you have not delighted, but you have given me an open ear. Burnt offering and sin offering you have not required. Then I said, Behold, I have come in the scroll of the book. It is written of me, I delight to do your will, O my God. Your law is within my heart. I have told the good news of the glad news of deliverance in the great congregation. Behold, I have not restrained my lips as you know, O Lord. I have not hidden your deliverance within my heart. I have spoken of your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your steadfast love and your faithfulness from the congregation. As for you, O Lord, you will not restrain your mercy from me. Your steadfast love and your faithfulness will ever preserve me. For evils have encompassed me beyond number. My iniquities have overtaken me. I cannot see. They are more than the hairs of my head. And my heart fails me. Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. Let those who do put... Let those be put to shame and disappointed altogether who seek to snatch away my life. Let those be turned back and brought to dishonor who delight in my hurts. Let those be appalled because of their shame who say to me, ha, 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 ha. But may all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who love your salvation say continually, great is the Lord. As for me, I am poor and needy. But the Lord takes thought for me. You are my help and my deliverer. Do not delay, O oh my God. May God add a blessing to the reading of his holy word this morning. Amen. So kids, you're dismissed. You're dismissed for children's churches. We continue our study in the book of Psalms. If you don't have a Bible, you can go right in the back and grab a Bible and uh, open up to Psalms. So we have been now, this is our second week, we are in a five, uh, well, five sermon series through the psalm, Advent in the Psalms. Last week, if you remember, we looked at Psalm 25, uh, and we talked about how the people of God were waiting for their Messiah, that God had promised that he would send a, a, a redeemer. It started in Genesis 3, chapter 3, verse 15, and then a covenant was made to Abraham that a descendant of his will be the Messiah and also made that same promise to the descendant of King David. That's why if you read the gospel according to Matthew written to a Jewish audience, it says, opens up with the very first verse, uh, verse. it says this, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham, the covenant made to these men, the Messiah will come and his name is Jesus. And the first advent, the incarnation, the God taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, being found in human form, Philippians 2, was the long-awaited fulfillment of the covenantal promise God made to his people. This week we look at Psalm 40 on how this covenant promise in what's called the advent, which means coming, helps us to understand that we are called to trust in God. Trust in God. Psalm 40. Next week, Psalm 72, if you want to go ahead and read. The week after that, Psalm 80, and then Psalm 98. So 72, 80, and 98. And this Advent season is a celebration. 
of the advent, of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we say the first coming of the Lord Jesus Christ because we know that God keeps every promise he made. And Jesus kept every promise he made. And he made a promise that someday he will return and he will redeem and renew and restore all things. And in some ways, as we celebrate the advent, we are actually, I think, in some ways, entering into what the Old Testament people were waiting for and what they were trusting in. They were looking, expecting, anticipating the first advent of the Messiah. And we celebrate that first advent, but we're now looking and, and we are expecting and we are anticipating his second coming. When our redemption, when our salvation will be complete. No more sin, no more brokenness, no more death. Perfect shalom, and we will reign and rule under the righteousness of Christ. And as we get into the psalm... Psalm 40, in preparation of the Advent season to trust God, I want to look through this psalm through four separate headings. The first heading is the pit of destruction. We'll find David in this place of a pit. The second thing, the second lens uh, uh, we want to look through is the deliverance. God is delivered. God delivers David. So the pit of destruction, the deliverance of God. And then David gets into this psalm and he's praising and worshiping God, and what does that look like, according to this psalm? And then finally, we'll end with the delight of Jesus. So the pit, the deliverance, the praise, and the delight. So number one, let me give you a little context. Psalm 40, we said last week that the psalms are of Hebrew poetry. They are, and you need to know what parallelism, as you combine, you can get the tape from next, last week. Verses are combined together to understand the interpretation of it. But if you notice in verse, uh, as the psalm opens in Chapter uh, first, very first verse, right above that, if you have your Bibles open, it says, to the choir master, a psalm of David. David writes and gives it to the choir master because this poetry, this, this Hebrew poetry is meant to be sung, to be remembered. And what David does in this psalm is he breaks the psalm up in two sections. The first section, verses 1 through 11, is David's thankfulness and praise that God had delivered him post-deliverance from his destruction, and he's responding through this deliverance of trust and praise and worship of God. Verses 1 through 11. In chapter, uh, 40, uh, uh, chapter 40, verse 12, we see David now getting into the second section, and he's dealing with another problem, another pit. The pit, the first one he's delivered from, and now he's in a second pit, a different one, and he's waiting and he's trusting God for a future deliverance. Just like last week, we don't know the exact time frame that this psalm was written in the life of David. We don't know the exact circumstances of his trouble, although the second part, we could certainly see how it applies to a specific time in David's life, but we're not really sure. And, and what David does is, in the first psalm, he's, he talks about the pit, he talks about his deliverance, he gives praise to God, and the second part, and he's looking for and waiting on the deliverance, he gets into another lament. We did that last week, we talked about what lamenting is. David is lamenting in the second part, waiting, waiting on the deliverance of God, he's waiting and he's lamenting, he's grieving over the situation he's in, he's expressing sorrow and despair, he's honest about what's going on in his life. He's honest about what's going on in his life. That may be a surprise to some. And we don't know, again, exact circumstances. I think God does that on purpose. I think God didn't tell us what Paul's thorn in the flesh was in 1 Corinthians, uh, in, in, when he wrote to the Corinthian church, I should say, uh, because I think he wants to show us and to teach us that we can and learn and apply the teaching of Scripture, what's going on into the multiple circumstances we find ourselves in. We could apply it to our lives. So let's look at the context of David now in the first part of this section. Chapter 40, verse 1. I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined, he, he bent down, he stooped, that's the Hebrew word, to me. And, and he heard heard my cry, he stooped down, he heard my cry, he drew me up from the pit of destruction, out of the miry bog, and then he set my feet uh, upon the rock, and, my, and, and my, now my, my steps are secure. He, he then put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God, and many will see what's going on in my life, and they will fear, and they will then themselves put their trust in the Lord. Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust. 
who does not turn to the proud, to those who go astray after a lie. Again, like Psalm 25, David now is waiting and trusting in a difficult time, yet this time he's, he's fervently speaking about his deliverance, his rescue, his post-deliverance, and he's, and he's praising God for, for, for the fact that God had kept his promises. God stooped down, God listened, God secured, God drew and put David on a rock. He took him out of this, this pit and he placed his steps firmly on solid ground. Uh, it's a symbolic of the protection and, and, and the keeping of God. And then he actually put a new song in my mouth that I could sing of his glory. It's always a joyful time. It's always a joyful time when we have an opportunity to look back. And, and, and we look back at God's deliverance. Uh, we look back on the difficulties and the trials and the hardships. And we see how the mighty hand of God has brought us through it. And we look back and we say, wow, God was in it. God drew me. God brought me through it. But how hard is it? while we're in the pit, to have a new song in our heart. See, David, like us, we're learning to wait and to trust on the Lord. Remember we said last week, waiting on the Lord doesn't mean we're sitting around, uh, you know, waiting on a car to get finished at a car dealer or, or at a doctor's office for our name. We're just standing there. No, waiting scripture, when the Bible talks about waiting on God, it's, it's active, not passive. It's trusting and actively pursuing God, being confident Living in faith, knowing even when life is hard and life is dark, that God is faithful. We're intently looking, being secured in his love, even in dark times. It was early in the afternoon of August 5th, 2010. August 5th, 2010. More than 700,000 metric tons of rock suddenly caved in, blocking the central passage to the tunnels in a San Jose copper and gold mine in Chile's Atacama Desert. Shaken miners close to the entrance soon made their way out, but 33 men, and some of you remember this, working deep underground were trapped beneath some of the hardest rock of the planet. Two days after this collapse, a second rock fell, blocking the ventilation staff shafts. Experts estimated the probability of locating and rescuing the mission workers Alive, less than 1%. Yet on October 13th, after 69 days, a record 69 days, underneath over 2,300 feet, these men emerged. Raised to the surface of the earth through a newly drilled escape tunnel in which a capsule was slowly lowered and raised by this giant crane, and each one was carried out of this rock, fragile but alive. And once the last one was hoisted out from the surface, the rescue team hold a banner up, if you remember it from watching it on television. Mission complete para Chile. Mission accomplished. The last one was out. Over a billion people watched that on television, the joy of those men. I cannot imagine being trapped 23, 2400 feet on the ground in the middle of the earth. In fact, when I was thinking about it, I was hyperventilated just thinking about it. But I know this. Those miners were experienced men. And when they assessed, assessed the situation, they knew there was no way they were getting out. 700,000 metric tons of rocks weighs twice of what the Empire State Building weighs. Have you ever been in that situation? Total hopelessness. King David found himself in a pit. In those days, they dug pits out of, out of uh, 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 the rock, out of the ground, and it would collect rainwater. Sometimes they were deep, and they would trap animals. They use uh, scriptures used metaphorically of death. It's Sheol, a place of the dead. It's used to hold prisoners. They would build these cisterns or, or pits. The sides were, were done in such a way where once you're in, you're not getting out. It was this empty pit, this kind of cistern that Joseph's wonderful, sweet, and loving, caring brothers threw him in to rot, to die, and then sold him to slavery, if you remember. 
It's the same kind of pit that Jeremiah found himself in in Jeremiah 38. He was, he was proclaiming the word of God against Judah, against southern uh, Jerusalem, saying the Lord is going to march on us with Babylon, and because we're not listening, you must repent of your sins. And they're like, yo, we don't like this prophet. Throw him in a cistern. And if it wasn't for a, a, a foreigner who was instructed by the king to get some ropes, 30 men, and lower the ropes down and get Jeremiah out, he would have died. It says in Jeremiah that he was in the mud and mire. That, that's, that's, if, you look at chapter, uh, if you look at chapter 40, verse 2, when he talks about the miry bog, it's clay. It's that stuff where you step in, not only are you stuck, but every time you step, you go deeper and deeper and deeper into the hole. David was in a pit. I don't think it was a literal pit. Some scholars say maybe it was a, 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 some sort of disease, a sickness. Psalm 38 talks about that. But I, I think it was most likely that David was in a pit and was, was delivered, the first section delivered, from a military crisis. He was a king. He was a military man. It was lots of wars. And he found himself in a pit, crying out to God. But here's the point. David is in a desolate place, and he knows there is no way out, period. Imagine falling into a well, mud and clay, and you're going deeper and deeper. Soon a sense of helplessness and desperation kicks in. Your pit could be poor health, the loss of your job. Someone close to you turned against you, an unfaithful spouse, rebellious children, day-to-day -day stress over providing for your family, maybe an addiction you can't break free from, and you're in a pit. Whatever the overwhelming sense of problem is your pit today. And that's why I think we don't know exactly what it is. I think David is metaphorically talking about pits so that we could understand and join him we understand what it's like to be in a pit and there are times that we find ourselves in these pits and these despair because of others decisions because the decisions of other people the, the actions of others and sometimes if you're like me I'm in a pit because I jumped in with both feet listen to David's second situation verse 12 for evils have encompassed me beyond number my iniquities have overtaken me. I'm overtaken. I'm done. I cannot see. They are more than the hairs of my head. My heart fails me. A little more personal. He acknowledged his sins. He's overtaken them like a fog. In verses 14 and 15, there are also those who oppose him. So it seems like the second pit that he's crying out for uh, has both the external challenges and the internal conflicts. He's dealing with his sins. And here's the principle. God allows these pits many times. God will put us in the pit at times so that we don't rely on ourselves but rely upon him alone. He says in verse 4, blessed, who, blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust, who does not turn to the proud, to those who go astray after a lie. See, when you're in that pit, it, you're looking for any way out. You're not necessarily listening for the Lord's directions. You're not waiting on the Lord. You've abandoned that because you just want out. And you're saying to yourself, I know what's better. I don't want to wait. I'm not going to trust. I'm going to bail. You know what that's called? It's called pride. And pride leads to idolatry, the mother of sins. We don't recognize or admit personal weaknesses. We think about our own inventiveness and our own effort. We're going to get out of this crisis. Whether you're in a financial jam and you're going to cheat and lie through it, you're in a relationship, maybe you're lonely and you're in a relationship that you know is not approved of God. Whatever it may be, you're saying, I know better than you. I'm not waiting around. I'm in this pit and I'm going to do everything I can to get out. David acknowledges his pits, his troubles. Yes, he's thankful as he's waited and trusted in the Lord for that past deliverance. And yes, he's waiting and trusting for his future deliverance. What about you this morning? Are you trying to find the answers yourself, or is it in the Word of God? Are you looking to your own efforts, your own inventiveness to, to get out of your pit, or, or are you saying, I'm waiting, I am trusting on God? We've had our pits. 
and God does deliver him. Look at verse 2 again. God drew me up. He drew me up from the pit of destruction out of the miry bog and set my feet upon a rock. I'm secure. Blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord. Not to the proud, not to after the lie. You have multiplied, verse 5, O Lord my God, your wondrous deeds. Look what you have done for me and your thoughts toward us. There's no one can compare to you. You see, this protection, this, is, this, this idea of God delivering him and placing him upon the rock is what it means to be blessed, to trust in the Lord. His marvelous deeds are just so numerous, I can't even, I can't even tell you all of them. And David needed deliverance. There are plenty, many places in the psalm that David needed deliverance from his enemies, even from Saul, the first king. But David knew he needed a greater deliverance for his sin. Again, look at verse 12. Evil has encompassed me. My iniquities, what he says, have overtaken me. I, I, I can't even see. The hairs of my head are more than that. And my heart fails me. And, and we know from David's life, as we look at it, we're going to in next year, in January, do the books of Samuel. We know that David's sin began as, in, in, in his descent into his self-made pit. First by staying home when all the, kings, all the other kings were supposed to go to battle. He stayed home. While enjoying himself in Jerusalem, he looks out over the rooftop and he sees a beautiful woman named Bathsheba in a tub. And he calls for her. Who is that woman? Bring her to the home of the king. And of course, she responds. He sleeps with her. He impregnates her. And he finds out that her husband, Uriah, not only is she married, she has a husband who is in his army. So he says, put him out in battle. Don't watch his back. Let him get killed. And the story we'll read of that in Samuel. And as you read the story of Samuel, you'll read, and we'll read next year, that David was a man after what? God's own heart. It wasn't because of the sin. But when David was confronted with his sin, He had faith and trust and humility and brokenness and repentance. And some say, yeah, well, David had to be exposed. He didn't expose himself. He had to be exposed. Then he was repentant. Okay, that's true. Been in this business long enough. Sometimes you catch people out there and they're making more excuses than, than you can imagine. Not David. He was broken by his sin. And he, he knows that it's overwhelming. He knows that his sin is overwhelming. More than the hairs of his head. I'm assuming he has a full head of hair. And his heart failed him. Verse 13. Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. Verse 16. May all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who what? Love your salvation. Your salvation. Continually say, great is the Lord. As for me, verse 17, I am poor and needy. But the Lord takes thought for me. You are my help. You are my help. You are my deliverer. Do not delay. Oh, my God, I'm waiting on you. And you see the contrast. See, in verses 1 through 11, the first section, David cries out. He waits on God, who not only delivers him from his enemy, but puts this new song in his mouth. And yet the second part, when David's dealing with his sin, he, he's crying out. He's trusting God because David understands that his hope and trust in that deliverance was ultimately the reality and the fact that the pit he is in, the pit that all of us are in, that we have dug for ourselves, is an eternal bottomless pit where we will face the eternal wrath of God for our sins and there is no way out. May all who seek you rejoice and be glad. May those who love your salvation love your rescue love your redemption love your deliverance they will say great is the lord the deliverance the rescue is from the cave from the pit of sin and the wrath of god and we're in that cave and there's seven hundred thousand tons of rock and we're stuck in that hole charles spurgeon says our sins were innumerable and so were his griefs david there was no escape for us from our iniquities, and there is no escape for him from the woes which we deserved, end quote. So 
whether, you're in, whether you realize the weight of sin and the pit of sin you are in with no way of escape or the pit of circumstance you find yourself trapped in, when you come to the end of yourself, it is then when God delivers you, when God saves you, when God rescues you, he gets the glory. It's him. Psalm 50, verse 15, I love this verse. Call upon him in the day of trouble. Call upon him in the day of trouble. I will deliver you, and you shall glorify me. You see, when God takes our breath away, and there's no more air, and then he breathes his air upon us by his grace, it's like glory to God. Yesterday I posted on my Facebook post a, a quote from Piper. I thought it would w fit well here. It says this. Piper writes, I rejoice in the sovereignty of God. Even the pits. I rejoice in the sovereignty of God because he wields it in all things to preserve himself as my greatest treasure, end quote. When you're drowning and you have no hope and God breathes into you his, by his grace, he gets glory and the byproduct is your joy. Christ, the greatest treasure. As you wait on him, as you trust him, as you look to him, as you remember the past deliverance, as you deal with the reality and recognize the present reality of, of Christ in your life now and his unchanging character of love and grace to work for you and not against you in the future. Listen, when God is enough in your crises and through your crises, he gets glory. And that's what David is saying, are you alone? He acknowledges his helplessness and trust in God and God alone. And in that way, he glorifies God. So whether you jumped in the pit yourself, both feet, or because of someone else, God gets the glory when you trust him with your whole heart, relying on his deliverance, his forgiveness, and being satisfied in him alone. That's the way. And that's what Advent's all about. That's what's all, Advent's all about, the coming of Christ, recognizing that we need rescue. That God himself took on a human body with a human nature, born in a, in a, in a, in, to a virgin girl in a stable, fully God and fully man in order to deliver us from the pit of sin, death and hell. He never sinned, never dug a pit himself like we have, but there on the cross where Jesus died, in that place where Jesus faced the inescapable pit, he took the eternal wrath of God. The Father for sinners like you and me. And in the Advent, we see this birth of this baby. And not only his birth, but how Christ in the midst of, of suffering and dying for sinners was waiting and trusting the Father. In the night in which Jesus was betrayed, in the night in which he was handed over to be crucified, he's praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's overwhelmed by the reality of death. And I don't think it's physical death. He understood the spiritual death, the hell he will experience when the Father turns his back on him. He will endure the judgment of wrath and wrath for our sins. And while he's in deep agony, what does Jesus do? He cries out to the Father to be delivered. And in the same prayer, in the same breath, he entrusts himself to the Father and says, but not my will. Let thine be done. Your will be done. Are we trying to climb out of these pits on our own this morning? Are we, are we making Christ our ultimate treasure and trust as Christ dies in our place, entrusting himself to the Father? Does this season feel like a bottomless pit to you? Are you dealing with disappointment or hurt or loneliness with drugs food, or other addictive habits. The temptation this time of year is, is, is strong and real. To, 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 to have our hearts and minds ruled by stuff, by things, by others, and not by God himself. The truth is, when we look to other things, we look to stuff, we're looking to those things to save us, to justify us, to be our comfort, to be our hope, to be our help, to deliver us from the pit, but not David. David said, blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust. Trust the Lord today. Trust the God of his word. Trust the Lord. Press the truths of the gospel of the Advent season. The Advent is about rescue. 
from the bottom of the pit, for those who trust God, whatever situation you are in, trust the Lord. And then we get to God's praise. We see the praise of David. He cries out, God, deliver me. And we have a song in his mouth. And he's telling of his mighty deeds. And he's calling others to trust God and worship God together in the congregation. Verse 3 again, he put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise. Many will see, verse 3, many will see, see what? The new song, the praise of God, many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. You have multiplied, O Lord, your wondrous deeds, your thoughts toward me. None can compare you. I will proclaim, he says, and tell of them. Yet they're more than they can be told. I don't have enough time to tell all your wondrous deeds. Verse 9, I have told the good news, the glad news of deliverance to the congregation. I have not restrained my lips. You see this overflowing of, of joy being poured out. Verse 10, I have not hidden your deliverance within my heart. I have spoken of your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your steadfast love and your faithfulness from the great com, uh, congregation. The, the joy that David is experienced, the joy that David is experienced is not solely or not primarily on his, is on his deliverance, but on his deliverer. There's a difference. The praise to our God. I've spoken of your faithfulness. I've not concealed your has said steadfast, loyal love and faithfulness to the congregation. He, he is trusting in, in God alone. And when he trusts in God alone and God rescues him from this miry pit and puts his feet on the solid ground, there's a song in his heart. Can you imagine, can you imagine 2,300 feet in a tube coming up through the, sea, through the rock and then they open it up and you step out? After 69 days, that is a glimpse. That is a glimpse of the joy when we stand before God, a holy God, and our sins have been washed and covered and forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ. That's a glimpse. Ephesians 2, we are dead in our sins. We are by children nature of wrath. But God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead, in the pit, in the rock, can't get out. He made us alive together with Christ, and by grace you've been saved, and raised up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You can't get any more secure than that. Seated with Christ, and we rejoice in all that he has done, and all that he is. Waiting means crying out and trusting and recounting his wonderful ways, obeying him, seeking him, rejoicing with him. But notice the psalm. Whenever God gives us deliverance from the pit, he puts a new song in our hearts and in our mouths. But his intentions is not for our benefit alone. It's also for the benefits of others through us. That's what he's saying. So we, we are to never let our songs rest solely on our own benefits, but we are to sing people into the kingdom, into the gospel, through a song that God has put in our hearts. How does that happen? It says by fearing him, by trusting him, by having reverence in him. John Piper writes this about verse 3. When he talks about put a new song, many will see in fear, he says this. How are they going to see that? What they do, what they see, he says, there's a person who... Contrary to human nature, was humble in distress and who never lost hope and banked on God and who, when he or she has been delivered, gives him glory. They see something real. This, this is a person who's trusting and waiting in a song in their heart. They see something real, genuine, authentic, something that rings true in the human heart. And as the conviction starts to build in the person who's watching this, who hasn't trusted Christ, he says, the truth and the reality of the life of the godly, of the one who's worshiping God in the midst of this, they begin to fear that, that their own belief and their unbelief. He says this, if God is that real and can be depended on to help those who hope in him, then probably those who disregard him and pin their hopes on all sorts of other things are in trouble, end quote. So we hope, we pray, we wait, we trust. And by God's grace, we're hoping that God opens the hearts and minds of those around us. And the song of the praise of the rescued saints become an a incredible means of evangelism. 
David is not ultimately focused on his deliverance, but his deliverer. And people need to see that. We're going to get into the life of, of David shortly, and as I said, next month. But listen to this very interesting verse. It's from the prophet Isaiah. And Isaiah is speaking for the Lord, and he's talking about David. And it's in Isaiah 55, verse 3. Listen to this verse. Incline your ear and come to me, God speaking through Isaiah. Hear that your soul may live. And I will make with you an everlasting covenant, my steadfast, sure love for David. The covenant of David and the covenant that God made with David. Behold, verse 4, I made him, David, a witness to the peoples. A leader and a commander for the peoples. He, he was a witness. So, so how shall we demonstrate, declare the gospel so that others can be rescued and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ? When you pin all your hope on Christ, when you pin all your hope while you're in the pit on Christ, when you are helpless and humble and wait patiently for the Lord, and when he comes in his own time and he delivers us, he, and secures us and puts a song in our mouth, man, it spills over into the proclamation, how great is our God? And our hope is that people see that in which we are waiting on, the person we are waiting on, is worth it. He is worthy. He is gracious. He is good by our testimony of waiting. There's a pastor. His name is Larry Kroon. He's a pastor of Wasilla Bible Church in Alaska. He tells, that, tells his story. I heard him tell this story, and it's true. I looked it up, just so you know. He says there was a young man in Alaska. He was a college student. He was 21 years old. And this 21-year-old college student was waiting on something that he loved very much. And his name was Bradley Honecker. He says, on Sunday, October 28th, at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, Sunday at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, he put a tent outside, he set up his chair, and he took his position, and he waited and waited and waited Sunday afternoon. Tuesday morning, he was in Alaska, 5 a.m., after sitting and waiting since Sunday, this man, Bradley Honecker, was the very first person in all of Alaska to receive his, the only, to receive the very first Krispy Kreme donut. He was first in line. He waited and waited. And now he gets a full year, back in 2010, a full year supply, free, of Krispy Kreme donuts. First kid in Alaska. I mean, it says a lot about donuts, especially to him, right? And he's waiting and became a witness, a testimony of what he was willing to wait for. When you and I wait for something, I mean really wait for something, it gives a witness to the thing you're waiting for. To wait intently on something is a testimony on what you're waiting for is worth it. For those who trust God. For those who are willing to wait on God in hard times, in the pit, who don't buy into the world philosophy or the idea, you know, ideology of the world, but waits and trusts and obeys God, gives testimony and witness of his incalculable worth. As we place our hope and trust in God, we, we testify and witness a glimpse of the incalculable worth of God to the world. The praise of David, see how good he is. The pit of destruction, the deliverance of God, and the praise of David, now finally the delight of Jesus. Look with me in the Psalm 40 again. David, in the first section, talking about his deliverance and praising God for it, before he goes to the other one that he's waiting on, there's in verse 6, there, there's, David is contrasting true worship, what, what true worship and false worship looks like. Look with me at verse 6, Psalm 40. In sacrifice and offering, he's talking about sacrifice and offering, that's worship, you have not delighted. But you have given me an open ear. Literally in the Hebrew, it means you dug an ear for me. It's a poetic imagery describing how God had given David an opportunity of showing him to truly worship God. In fact, the book of Hebrews, we'll look, turn to it in a minute, quotes this verse, the book of Hebrews in the New Testament, quotes this verse in what's called the Septuagint, which is the Greek Old Testament. And they translate the word ear to body. A body you have prepared for me. So the interpreter is taking the Hebrew Old Testament Bible and translating it into the Greek Old Testament Bible. Understood that, that poetic term in Hebrew meant the whole body. That As you hear the word of the Lord, as you hear what God wants from us, and we respond with our whole being, 
That's what it means. You hear and you respond your whole body. And I think that's the significance of David saying, you've dug for me an ear. You've got my attention. How? How are we to delight in God? How are we? It's not offering and sacrifices. So how? Look at verse 6. Burnt offering and sin offerings you have not required. Then I said, behold, I have come. In the scroll of the book it is written of me, verse 8, I delight to do your will, O my God. Your law is written within my heart. The prophet Jeremiah will talk about the new covenant when God will pour out his spirit and he will put the law in our minds and write them on our hearts and he will be our God and we will be his people. To Jeremiah, having the law written in our hearts is a definition of what it means to be in right relationship. I, 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 your, your word, your law is in my heart. I delight in that. That's, that's the right relationship with, with God. Some people look at this and say, well, David's saying, you know, sacrifice is not what you want. So he's disparaging. He is, he's belittling the law. No, he's not. David is not belittling the law. David as a king, and we'll see it in Samuel, he would have sacrificed in the temple and worshipped the Lord before he went out to battle to atone for sins, to, to, to bring a fellowship offering. In fact, there's a, there's a Hebrew scholar by the name of Rohn, a uh, 19th century Hebrew scholar. He said this concerning this verse about David. He's saying, this is what David is saying. My heart is full of your abundant goodness. He just worshiped. He's worshiping the Lord. He's saying, your heart is full of the goodness toward me. How can I express it? David is saying, how can I express it? In times past, I might have thought that an offering was the proper thing to do. But now I realize that what you really desire is an obedient heart that delights to do your will. End quote. That's exactly what David is saying. And the book of Samuel's, we'll read, talks about the first king Saul and the second king David. And now the first king Saul was disobedient. And, and, and Samuel, the prophet, comes to him and says, the Lord, uh, has the Lord has great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices or in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. So the point is, listen, you could sacrifice, but if there's no obedience, don't come. David's saying, you know what? I, I, I'm the Lord's anointed I'm presenting myself, I'm dedicating myself as an offering to the Lord. And in my commitment, I want this wholehearted desire to conform to the ways and the wills of our God. Delight in you. I want to delight in you. I want your word to be in my heart. I want to follow your ways. But remember last week we said that when David is expressing things like this, immediately he's talking about his heart, but he's pointing to something bigger and greater than himself. He's pointing here to the Messiah, the true and the better king. Verse 7, lo, I come. Reminds me of Jesus. I've come only to do the will of my Father. I do all that he says I should do, and I hear all the things that he, he wants me to do. Everything I've come to do, your will. And it's written of me. We, Jesus said many times in the Old Testament, the Old Testament points, and Moses wrote of me. I mean, where would David, uh, what would be written of David in a scroll that would determine his coming into the world? See, these verses are pointing to the greater and better king of Israel. The king of kings, the Lord of Lord, the Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, the one that was written about in the scroll of the book. David's not attacking the system of sacrifice. He grew up in that. It, it was part of the law given to God's people. But David understands. David understands. And he knew that it was not an adequate system to procure eternal salvation. It was pointing somewhere. Turn with me, if you have your Bibles, to Hebrews. David is writing this psalm. The writer of Hebrew goes back to this psalm and says, this is Jesus. And I want to show that to you as we close. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 4. Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he's quoting this, applying it to Jesus Christ. For it is possible, for it is impossible, for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Consequently, therefore, when Christ came into the world, lo, I have come, right? He said, sacrifices and offerings you have not, you have not desired, but a body you have prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, talking about Jesus, behold, I have come to do your will, O God. It is written of me in the scroll of the book. That's verse 7. David does not obey the will of God completely. David does not in any way, shape, or form 
fulfill the law of God. David is a sinner like you and like me. Jesus, the only one who could say, I have come to do your will perfectly, O God. That's why in Hebrews goes on and says this in verse 8. When he said, you have neither desire nor taken pleasures in sacrifices and offerings and burnt offerings and sin offerings, that's the law, then he added, behold, I've come. He does away with the first in order to establish the second. What he's saying is all those sacrifices, all those sacrifices could never weigh, never take away sins. Listen, every priest stands daily in his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which could never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sin, he sat down at the right hand of God. Christ offers himself for sin once and for all. He simultaneously fulfills and abolishes the Old Testament sacrificial sinner, a sacrificial system. All sacrifices are limited because we, the one who is giving the sacrifices, are sinners. But Christ is perfect. And that's what the Advent is. The Advent is the coming of God. God fulfills his own delight and demands by giving his son a perfect sacrifice for sinners. This is promised in the Old Testament, the scroll of the book. And fulfilled in Christ who delighted to do the Father's will. It was Christ alone that had the law of God written perfectly in his heart. Not David. And the Advent season shows us how we can trust God while we wait on him during the ups and downs because of the gospel, because of the Advent. Jesus Christ himself leaves heaven's glory, becomes a man, suffers, vulnerable, weak, and hated, yet lived a perfect life. Lived a perfect life, always trusting in, always delighting in the Father's will. And when he hung on the cross, and he absorbed our wrath in himself. After this wrath-absorbing sacrifice was over, what does he do? He cries out, it is finished, atonement made, and then what? Into your hands. Father, into your hands, I trust you. Into your hands, I commit my spirit. God was faithful to him, and through Christ, God is faithful to you. Jesus, the Son showed his delight in his fathers by his perfect obedience. And the father showed his delight in the son when the skies opened up and he said out loud for all to hear, this is my beloved son, this is my loved son in whom I am well pleased, delighted in, listen to him. And now in this Advent season, remember, remember, as, as the son delighted in doing the father's will, and the Father delighted in the Son's obedience and work of redemption. You and I, believers in Christ, trusting in Christ, are brought into that delight. Psalm 40 is all about Advent. We see the Savior offering salvation to sinners. Not, not if you can do it yourself. Not if you think you can do it yourself. But for those who truly know they're in the pit and cry out for mercy and grace, God will respond. And by faith you can trust that Jesus Christ went to that pit. And died a grueling death so that you can be rescued from that pit. And your feet can be established on the rock of security in Christ. And remember this, no matter what your circumstances are today, no matter how deep your pit is today, it doesn't compare to the pit. You will find yourself standing before a holy God guilty of your sin. But Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ went into the pit so that you can be delivered and rescued out of yours. Advent is all about Christ died while we were still sinners. Now, as the band comes up, let me share this one verse with you. I shared it with my community group. Listen to this verse. Psalm 18, verse 16. He, God, went from on high and took me and drew me out of many waters. He rescued me from my strong enemies. And from those who hated me, for they were too mighty for me. They confronted me in the day of my calamity, and the Lord was my support. He brought me into a broad place, a, place, a rock. He rescued me because he delighted in me. Not in sinner Lou, not in sinner David, King David. 
but in the perfect, spotless righteousness of Christ that I'm wrapped in his righteousness, imputed to me, and now God delights through the Son to the people of God. Do you know Christ that way? Have you trusted him? Have you placed your hope in him? Do you know him? Do you love him? Do you run to him? I hope you do. As we respond, let's respond in faith. Father, thank you for recording this psalm for us. Father, thank you. And David's honesty. Lord, we need to be honest. We need to, we need to be honest with ourselves that we are in that pit because of our sin. And Lord, there's no way out. So you rescued us. Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior, died for our sins, rose victorious over it so that we can be rescued and placed upon a solid rock. Father, help us to respond in faith and trust in Jesus Christ today.